Well, conscience, the troubled conscience. There's a lovely little story in the book of Samuel that describes really what's the universal experience of conscience. Saul and his uh, band of soldiers are pursuing David. You might remember the story. David is running from Samuel. David is hiding in the wilderness. Samuel comes upon where David is and goes into a cave, um, as the old, old versions say, to cover his feet, um, which means to relieve himself. So, so Saul goes into the, into the cave because he needs to go, not knowing, of course, that David and his men are at the back of this cave. David's men say to him, here's your chance. Uh, literally, uh, you know, we've caught him with his pants down. Here's your chance. Go up and kill Saul. And so David creeps up towards Saul through the cave full of conflicting thoughts as to what he should do. But when he gets to where Saul is, all that he does, is, if you know the story, is just cut off a corner of the robe that Saul had put to one side as he was doing his business. And David creeps back and doesn't let, know, let Saul know what's happened until afterwards. But even so, David feels terrible for what he's done. Terrible perhaps because he seriously contemplated killing Saul terrible for dishonouring him by chopping off the corner of his robe. And in the old King James Version it says, and it came to pass afterwards that David's heart smote him because he'd cut off Paul, Saul's robe. His heart smote him. And that's the experience of conscience that we all feel at different times in our lives. When we are creeping up towards something that we think we probably shouldn't do and know we shouldn't do, and we just feel in our guts that it's a line we shouldn't cross and all these feelings emerge within us. We start to feel a hotness or, or perhaps a pang or a pain that's somewhere in here that we can't quite work out where. A sense of shame, a sense of guilt. Our heart smites us. But then we're complicated creatures, aren't we, you and me? Uh, sometimes we go ahead and do it anyway, don't we? Even though our heart is crying out to us that we shouldn't and the flush of shame and guilt just grows even stronger. Although, very often it fades after a time and we do that same thing again. And perhaps more than once, and the pang of guilt and the pang of conscience diminishes, almost as if we were desensitising ourselves to it. So that by the time we've done that thing half a dozen times, we don't really feel quite so bad about it as we once did. As Mr Bennett says in Pride and Prejudice, um, feeling very ashamed for being such a neglectful father, he says, I'm heartily ashamed of myself, Lizzie, but don't despair, it will pass. <laughs> and no doubt more quickly than it should. What is that feeling, that feeling of our heart rising up and condemning us? Well, historically, it's been described as conscience, as a kind of inner moral umpire that blows the whistle on us when we're approaching to do the wrong thing or have done the wrong thing. But it's a complicated topic, conscience. It's complicated for a number of reasons. It's complicated because it's personal. There'll be many of you here tonight who have things on your conscience, who have a troubled conscience perhaps over certain things you've either recently done or have done in the long past or are thinking about doing later on or tomorrow. But it's also complicated because of our culture and society, because the way our culture thinks about this topic, about conscience, the way it understands conscience, is really quite confusing for us as Christians because our culture has taken a turn of mind on this subject over the last couple of hundred years that's proved to be difficult and confusing and a bit of a dead end. Our culture really is terribly confused on the subject of conscience, about how we decide what is right and wrong and what we do with those feelings when they rise up within us. For example, what's going on with a conscience vote? That is in the news again. Uh, regarding same-sex marriage and whether it ought to come to a conscience vote. What's a conscience vote? It's a vote where the parliamentarians get to vote according to some inner moral sense rather than along party lines. But what does that mean? It must mean that each of the politicians has a, some sort of inner feeling about what is truly right in this instance that should form the basis of their vote, some inner intuition. But if that's the case, why is that only voted on in some occasion on, and on some issues? Surely there are more than just one or two issues that the parliamentarians have a, have a conscience about. Does that mean most of the time when they vote on other issues, they're voting against their conscience or in ignoring their conscience? And how is a vote the best way to establish what the correct way forward is if all the politicians have their own inner feelings about the correct way to act?
It's all indicative of the confusion our culture experiences about these sorts of issues, about how we decide what is right and wrong, and how we deal with those strange feelings of conscience. So we're going to talk about this tonight, this complicated and somewhat troubling phenomena. And we're going to start by talking about how our culture has come to think about conscience over the past 200 years. It's really important that we do that because it infects and affects the way we think about conscience as Christians, the way our culture does, the way our society tells us that conscience operates. And the problem with conscience as far as our culture is concerned is that with morality and with ethics, we've somewhat lost touch with reality. And I just want to explain to you for a moment what I'm, I mean when I say that. Just over 200 years ago, I'm going to sketch in some context and some background. Just over 200 years ago, there began a shift in the way our society thought about most of the big questions and issues of life, about God and authority, about morality and about ethics. And it was called the Enlightenment. And the consequences of the shift and the changes in thought that happened around the time of the Enlightenment are now still with us. In fact, they're now so totally normal to us in our everyday life that we don't really realise they've happened and we don't realise how different they are from the thought world of the Bible. And to explain this quite momentous change in the way our culture has come to think about morality and conscience, I'm going to use, use an illustration that I also used in our first Centre for Christian Living event back in March. And it's the illustration of the house. For most of human history, um, people have thought of reality like a great big house. I'm talking about all of reality, everything that exists, with an upstairs and a downstairs and a staircase connecting the two of them. And upstairs is God, the world of spirit, the world of ideas and morality and values. And downstairs is the everyday life that we experience, the, life, the, the world of science and knowledge, and stuff and physicality. And the upstairs and downstairs is connected by a staircase. That is, there's a communication between God and the world of ideas and, and the good and this everyday life that we experience. Different religions and, and philosophies had different accounts of what that staircase was and how it all worked, but most human philosophies and thoughts basically had this shape until the time of the Enlightenment. But at that time, people not only began to doubt what was really upstairs and whether in fact there was a God upstairs, they especially began to doubt whether there was any reliable staircase between upstairs and downstairs. They began to think that it was impossible really for us to know what was upstairs. They began to distrust the Bible, the church, the authorities that said this is what upstairs was really like. And they came to the conclusion that we really have to make our decisions about life and about who we are and about what's right and wrong, just ourselves downstairs without any reference to anyone else. This movement was called sometimes humanism or secular humanism and it had massive implications for all sorts of subjects. At our last CCL event we looked at those implications for religion and for how we think about religion. But it had huge implications for morality and ethics. Because with no staircase, with no access to any God upstairs to tell us what was right or wrong or to give the world some shape or moral order, how on earth do we figure out what we should do? What constitutes good? What constitutes evil? How could we perceive what was right or wrong without any sort of access to upstairs? And one of the answers that that emerge was to reframe what we mean by the word conscience. That in the absence of any absolute knowledge of right and wrong, any law from God, any morality that was established by some creator, we need just to follow our conscience. The conscience came to be seen as the moral guide, as the thing that established morality for each one of us in the absence of any objective guide from upstairs. Some people saw this conscience that was within us as a kind of rational faculty as an inner guide or compass by which we could think through what the right thing to do was in any particular circumstance. Others argued that conscience was not rational but intuitive, experiential, feelings-based. That all we had to do was follow our hearts and make personal choices and that there was no higher principle inside us to guide us, just the capacity to make our own choices according to our feelings and inclinations. And so in the course of Western society over the last 200 years, conscience came to be thought of as an autonomous 
faculty within us, as a, like a moral guide or teacher within all of us that helped us choose the good and avoid the bad. And that thinking about what that moral guide was like really ended up as a bit of a battle between head and heart as to whether that guide was rational or mainly experiential. And I guess we could say without too much argument that the heart won that battle, certainly in the last hundred years or so. Now, for most people in our society, morality or ethics is voluntarist. It's what we choose. It's what we feel to be correct intuitively in our guts. And conscience has become identified virtually as synonymous with that feeling or choice, which is why we have conscience votes in Parliament. But this just creates a mess. It's created a, me it's created a mess for us socially, but it's created a mess for us personally as well. Because amidst all the competing claims of what might be right and what might be wrong, I just have to make my own experiential choice. And yet I still feel the pain when I go against my own choices. When we go against what we believe to be right and true, even though we have chosen what that right and true might be. And so people still have to go to extraordinary lengths today to try to appease this pain, to try and ease this sense of shame that they feel, even though the thing that they've transgressed is just their own standards that they've chosen for themselves. And they find that they can't drown the pain or atone for it. In fact, they find that in this weird world of ethics we now live in, where everybody chooses their own morality according to their own conscience, who is there to forgive you when you fail to live up even to your own standards? As many people have found, forgiving yourself turns out to be the hardest forgiveness of all. Now I'm talking, uh, to start off with now, about the confusion about conscience within our culture, because obviously it affects us as Christians as we think this through. And when we come to the Bible, we find quite a different view of what conscience is. And we just need to be aware that what we're about to see is quite a contrast from what our culture sees conscience as being. Because in the Bible, we find that um, we find some quite helpful scriptural truths that give shape to what we mean about conscience. In the Bible, we discover that the world is a moral place, that there is such a thing as right and wrong, and that when people commit awful acts, they really are evil, not because they just have chosen that and they've decided it's evil, but because the world actually has a moral shape. The Bible teaches that God made the world with a moral order, that it's woven into the fabric of the creation that God has made, that just as there are laws of nature, there are also, in a sense, laws of morality, that it is woven into the way the world is and in the way we are. That downstairs has indeed been shaped and created and given its form and order by the good God who created it by his character, and that morality is something real and objective, that's part of the creation downstairs that God has made, not just something we impose upon it by our own choices. And the Bible reveals, of course, that there is indeed a staircase, that we have access to this knowledge about the reality of the world. We have access through the creation itself by looking around us and seeing how God has made the world to some extent. We have access to it through his words to Israel in the Old Testament. And of course, finally and completely, we discover what the real moral shape and order of our world is when God's word or revelation becomes flesh and walks among us as a man in the, wor in the works and words and person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in him, we see exemplified and revealed the moral order or shape that God has woven into our world in human form. We see a thoroughly good man who exemplifies all that we want to be and should be like. And we recognize this because of the second truth the Bible tells us, and that is that God has made us as morally aware people. That part of the way God has, has made us is that we recognize these categories of right and wrong, and they make some sense to us. And we all have this capacity, this faculty, this awareness that morality exists even if we become terribly confused about how we might know what it is. And one of the words the Bible commonly uses to describe the place where this hurt or pain happens, the hurt or pain when we transgress our sense of morality or ethics, is conscience. The pain in our conscience, the pain that we experience, is like the tearing sound when our actions, 
and our moral values part company. Conscience in the Bible is like a judge who passes sentence on us and punishes us and makes us feel something because we've gone against our principles. But like a judge, conscience is only active in the Bible when we've committed a crime. Judges don't tend to walk the streets congratulating people for obeying the law or uh, slapping them on the back for driving according to the speed limit. Judges get active when you break the law. And conscience is like that as well. Have you noticed that? You don't feel anything in your conscience. You don't feel that pain until you creep up against something that you know you shouldn't do. And so if you're acting quite rightly, then you might say that your conscience is clear or is inactive or leaves you alone or testifies that, that you're doing okay. Yeah, we won't look up many Bible verses now because we're going to be short of time, I know. But you might look at Romans 2.15 or Romans 9.1 later on to see examples of the Bible's usage of, of the word conscience in this way. So it's important to note, in the Bible, the conscience doesn't make the law. The conscience judges us when we break the law. It doesn't discover what morality is. That's what it's become in our culture a moral teacher, something to discover morality. In the Bible, the conscience doesn't discover morality. It's not a law maker. It just pronounces against you when you've broken that law or it gives you a pass if you haven't. And so the conscience in, conscience in the Bible has reference to or takes its cue from the moral reality that's actually out there, the good things that are built into this creation, the fact that certain things are right and wrong in the way we live. The conscience um, applies that uh, knowledge to our hearts, to our feelings, to our emotions as we walk up against it and transgress against it. And we apprehend that reality with our minds. That is, we come to understand what is good or evil as it is made known to us in God's revelation. And Pete will be exploring this in particular in the second half of our evening, how our minds or what, what part our minds play in shaping our Christian lives and our knowledge of what is good and evil. What conscience does is simply accuse you or leave you alone. Now, this is how the word was largely used in the literature of the time of the Bible. There's quite a lot of research being done as to how the word synodesis, the Greek word for conscience, was used in the first century and in the surrounding literature. And it's used very much like this, as a judge that accuses you when you transgress. But the Bible adds a quite revolutionary and liberating idea that Greek culture didn't have, and that is that it might be possible to have a bad or guilty conscience cleansed or made clean. A good or clear or clean conscience in the Bible is now possible, the Gospel of Jesus says. And the path to it, the path to the cleansed conscience is of course first by having a bad conscience. It starts when your mind actually gets in touch with the reality of what's out there in the world and with God. That God is indeed the creator of the world and the Lord and maker of everything, including us. That he's a good, loving and righteous creator. That he's made us to live a certain way and that we've constantly chosen to ignore him and to go our own way and to flout the way he says we should live. We've constantly sinned, in other words, is the word the Bible uses to summarise that. And more than that, everything in us tends in that direction. We want to sin, we want to be bad. And when our minds grasp this truth, when this dawns on us, when this realization hits us that that's the reality about God and about us, then our consciences smite us as never before. And they're completely right to, because we are guilty at that point. Not just of one particular wrong thing, but of being completely in the wrong of rebelling against the totality of, of God and his order and his world and his morality. But this realisation and the awful pain that, that it brings to us when that dawns on us that that's our position and that's our situation, it's the first step towards the most wonderful liberation, of course. Because the same revelation in the Bible tells us that God has done something to cleanse that conscience. He's provided complete forgiveness and cleansing for our sins through the death of his son on the cross. And so through what Jesus has done on the cross, through the blood that he shed there, the most extraordinary possibility opens up. That of a genuinely clear conscience, one that is fully informed of how much we've transgressed, 
and yet stands fresh and clean and joyful in the presence of God because that same God has wiped all those transgressions away and put them upon his son. I have to quote this verse. In Hebrews 10, the author says, Brothers, we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. We have confidence to go into God's very presence, he says, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The gospel, friends, is the news that the messed up, divided self we have that can't meet even our own standards, let alone God's, can be healed and cleansed and made new and whole again. That the judge inside us can be silenced once and for all because of the blood of Jesus. And it happens by being reconciled to the God we've been ignoring and rebelling against all this time. This is the foundation of the, of the New Testament's teaching on conscience that it's a judge that afflicts us and, in a sense, condemns us for our transgression of the good we know we ought to do. And yet, that judge can be silenced because of the work of Christ. And that new relationship we have with God means we can get back in touch with what the world is really like and what we're really like. And Peter will say much more on this, I hope, as, we, as he talks about our mind and our understanding of the world. But I want to move on just in conclusion to sketch a couple of ways in which this understanding of conscience relates to Christian living, since that's what we're here tonight to talk about, Christian living and the place of conscience in relation to that. I just want to map out a few scenarios, a few examples. Um, there are plenty more scenarios and perhaps you might want to follow those up in, in question time and, and by the, the text message. But let me ask first of all, what happens when Christians have real differences of conscience? When something, that, when something strikes you as being terribly wrong and you feel the pain inside, and I'm left completely unmoved by it, I think that it's fine. What happens when we differ on conscience? What happens, for example, if one of us is terribly burdened by drinking alcohol, that that just goes against my conscience? I just feel terrible if I even think about doing that. Whereas others may have um, no bad conscience at all about that and might quite enjoy a nice glass of red with dinner. What do we do about those differences of conscience among Christians? Paul deals, of course, with exactly this sort of issue in a couple of places in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 8 to 10 and in Romans 14 and 15. The circumstance then, of course, was largely to do with Jews and Gentiles, uh, with certain Christians who hadn't figured out that, that all foods had now been made clean in Christ, that it was okay to eat a bacon sandwich now and have a prawn cocktail or whatever you're going to have in a way that no, that used to be the case under the laws of the Old Testament. And for some of them, they just hadn't quite figured that out yet, and so the idea of having a bacon sandwich just filled them with bad conscience. That They struggled, they felt guilty, they felt, I shouldn't be doing this. Now, their consciences at that point weren't determining what was right or wrong. They were reacting, reacting to what their minds perceived to be right and wrong. You see the difference? They were perceiving that bacon sandwiches which were not right, that was their belief, and so to go near one just couldn't be done. They felt terrible. In, in a sense, in their case, their minds or their law books, their perception of what was right and true was just out of date or a bit confused. And so their consciences smote them when they went near that prawn cocktail. And Paul's advice is, of course, that you shouldn't go against that feeling and, and you shouldn't deliberately do something that you still deeply believe to be wrong. And he also says to the, to the Christians who, who feel quite fine about their bacon sandwiches, don't make it hard for your brothers and sisters. Don't go and, and eat right in front of them. Don't shove it in their face. Don't make their consciences flare up because of your freedom. Now, it's very important to see that what Paul is talking about here are things that really are quite um, uh, matters of, of some triviality, of, of food and of drink, of whether you celebrate some day as a religious day or not. He's not talking about things that really are deeply and objectively evil or wrong that people might have a different conscience about. He's talking about having genuine, heartfelt differences about side issues with other Christians. And his, and his uh, message is very clear. Be kind to each other. 
Recognise that it takes time for some people to think things through and be gentle and gracious to, it, to one another. But that's not the same as having genuine differences about things that are unambiguously immoral. So I'm not going to do this. My wife's here tonight. I'm not going to do this, sweetheart. But if I was to run off with someone else's wife <laughs> and say, look, I'd, I've, I've felt for a long time that God really wants me to be happy and I deserve this and I'm going to run off with this other woman because that's going to make me happy and I have a real peace about it in myself. Now, this is not a case of me following my conscience. This is a case of me fooling myself. This is a case of me trying to make up the rules to suit myself and then persuade myself that it's okay. And most people, if they try hard enough, can persuade themselves that it's okay because that's the kind of perverse, selfish people that we all are inside. We might even be able to get our consciences to go along for a little while and persuade ourselves that life isn't too painful. But of course, in the end, this leads to a damaged conscience, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But if Christians have differences about these sorts of questions, about things that are objectively, morally true or untrue, good or evil, right or wrong, then it's not, these cannot be resolved by an appeal to conscience, that I feel okay about doing this, therefore it's okay to do this. It can only be resolved by an appeal to where the truth is to be found about moral reality. And that, of course, is in the pages of Scripture. The second thing I want to say about conscience in the Christian life is that our consciences can be faulty, like every other part of us. They can just break down at times and not function as they should. The two most common types of faulty conscience are the seared or cauterized conscience, uh, and the tender conscience. The seared conscience is, is the conscience that's been so beaten down and so ignored for so long that it has ceased to function. When we become so accustomed to doing evil or doing the wrong thing and ignoring our conscience so thoroughly for so long, it no longer has a voice to tell us that we've done wrong, that to smite us, to, to have that pang or that guilt. And we all know the experience of that to some extent, don't we? We all know personally there are those things that we do wrong and we do wrong repeatedly and over time we feel less bad about doing them than we should. We all know that feeling. At the extreme end of that damaged conscience, of course, is the psychopath or the sociopath who, who no longer feels remorse at all. His conscience is dead. But we don't have to go that far for our consciences to become insensitive to evil. But then at the opposite extreme, our consciences also can be too tender there are some of us who experience intense shame and guilt even when the crime is really not so great, who refuse to believe that their consciences can be clear and forgiven. Or even if they do acknowledge the possibility of forgiveness by God, still feel so ashamed and so guilty, their conscience continues to afflict them for quite some time. Now, there are many reasons that some of us are like this. It's very often related to our upbringing. It's very often related to fairly deep wounds emotional and psychological wounds and insecurities. But it's a human weakness and failing like the so many weaknesses and failings we have. And the overly, tenderly, overly tender conscience can be healed or can at least become more robust over time and with much prayer and with fortification and education through the truth of the Bible, through the Word of God to understand more clearly and to be buttressed by that truth. But it often takes a very long time. And finally, I just want to say a word about conscience as a normal experience in the Christian life. Our consciences will keep operating. They'll keep blowing the whistle on us at different points in our Christian lives because we'll keep doing the wrong thing and feeling terrible. That's just the normal experience of Christian living, and you shouldn't think that's, that's bad uh, or unusual. We will feel grief and pain, and we may even cause each other that pain or grief when we pull each other up and point out to each other that, hey, you're heading in the wrong direction. And I suddenly realise from the word that you've spoken to me that I am heading in the wrong direction and my conscience flares up and I feel that grief or pain. And being grieved or pained in our conscience in this way is not a bad thing, but it's not a good thing. It's just something that happens. It all depends on how we respond to it. Uh, because the grief itself or the feeling uh, is an opportunity to respond rightly or wrongly. Um, Paul writes about this in, uh, in 2 Corinthians 7. This is the last passage I'll just briefly quote. Uh, he's caused the Corinthians some grief in their conscience. 
because of his letter to them. And he says, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. You see, the Christian response to a grieved conscience is first to check that your conscience is functioning well and is well educated, that you really are doing something wrong here according to what God has revealed. But then it's to turn back, then it's to repent. And it's to turn to Christ to be forgiven again and again and again, daily to be forgiven and to experience once more, as we experience daily, the joy of a cleansed conscience, a conscience that's washed clean once again by the work of the Lord Jesus. I'm going to pray for just a few seconds and then I'm going to pass over to Peter. Father, we thank you for the fact that you've made us as moral beings and as moral people with the faculties and understandings to, to know what is right and wrong and good and evil, and that you reveal that knowledge to us partly in your creation, more completely in the Old Testament, and then finally and, and wonderfully through the Lord Jesus and in the writings of, of his apostles. We thank you so much for giving us that knowledge and, and putting us in touch with that reality and for making us people, Father, who can understand and respond to that reality rightly. We pray that we would understand our conscience as well and that we listen and, and respond when they grieve us and pain us in the right way. And Father, we pray that we would be tender and kind to each other in the differences on conscience that we have and be gracious to each other in those things too. Thanks for this time together, Father. Amen.